Good evening, everyone. This is Lynn Fridley. I'm the Director of Education for Maddie's Fund. We have a really good program for you tonight. Um, we are starting a little early because our speakers would like to ask some questions. So we're going to go through a series of three poll questions. I'm going to get one up there right now. And we'd like for you to answer these questions on your screen. After you answer all three, then um, just sit back and wait. We'll give you the results as soon as the rest of the folks out there in webcast land join us. So the first question is, uh, do you already have a field trip or a day outing program for dogs at your shelter? This is a yes or no question. So answer on your screen, please. We'll give you a few minutes to get that in there. Well, not minutes, maybe seconds. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to the second poll question. Second one says, does your shelter already do longer stay fostering for adult dogs? And that's yes, but only medical cases. Yes, but only behavior cases. Yes, but only medical and behavior cases. And yes, for all dogs, including longer stay. Or, no, not yet. Please answer this question on your screen. Does your shelter already do longer stay fostering for adult dogs? Poll question number three. If you haven't tried sleepovers or temporary fostering yet, why not? And you can check all that apply. Not having enough staff to handle the new type of fostering program? Logistics of picking and getting dogs back seems challenging. Picking up and getting dogs back. Uh, dogs losing out on time in the shelter where they're visible to potential adopters. Stressful for dogs to leave the shelter with someone for three days and then come back. And for some reason, I can't see that. Oh, there we go. Liability, liability of dogs being off-site but still in foster care. What if something goes wrong or something else? So please take the time to answer this question and check all that apply. Okay. So I know that as we've been talking, there's been more people filing into the virtual lobby. So I'm going to start over again with poll question one. Those of you who have not answered the question, this is your opportunity. Do you already have a field trip or day outing program for dogs at your shelter? Click yes or no. Please click on your screen and not in the Q&A box. Do you already have a field trip or day outing program for dogs? All right. Well, question number two is, does your shelter already do longer stay fostering for adult dogs? Yes, but only medical cases. Yes, but only behavioral cases. Yes, but only medical and behavioral cases. And yes, for all dogs, including longer stay dogs. No, not yet. Please answer on your screen. We're going to talk about these results in just a few minutes. So, the third poll question is, if you haven't tried sleepovers or temporary fostering yet, why not? Check all that apply. Not having enough staff to handle the new type of fostering program, logistics of picking up and getting dogs back seems challenging. Dogs losing out on time in the shelter where they're visible to potential adopters. Stressful for dogs to leave the shelter with someone for a few days and then come back. Liability of the dogs being off-site but still in foster care. What if something goes wrong? Or something else? Please answer on your screen. And we're going to now jump into the presentation itself. So Jesse Guglielmo will take it from here. Take it over, Jesse. Thank you, Lynn. Good evening, everyone. I am Jesse Guglielmo, Education Specialist at Maddie's Fund. 
Tonight we have two speakers, Lisa Gunter and Kelly Dewar, who will take you through the science of how sleepovers help shelter dogs and how your shelter can set up foster sleepovers in our Maddie's Fund webcast, Foster Sleepovers, How Temporary Fostering Can Improve the Lives of Shelter Dogs. Lisa Gunter is a doctoral candidate at Arizona State University, where she studies the impact of stress on the welfare of kennel dogs and post-adoption interventions focused on owner retention. She has published her research in scientific journals and presented her findings at numerous conferences. Kelly Dewar is Maddie's foster care specialist and foster expansion coordinator for a national study of foster care for medium and large dogs with long shelter stays. She also co-coordinates the Medium and Large Adult Dog Foster Apprenticeships, which bring shelter leaders from across the country together to learn how to implement foster programs for adult dogs. Before we get started, let's go over a few housekeeping items. Please take a look at the left side of your screen where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you'll ask questions throughout the presentation. Please get your questions in early. Questions submitted late in the presentation may not be processed in time for a response. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, you can click the Help widget at the bottom of your screen. Additionally, don't forget to check out the green resource widget also at the bottom of your screen, where you can find helpful handouts and information for tonight's presentation. This presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours should you wish to view it again. Thank you for being here with us tonight, Lisa and Kelly. As some of you may have noticed, in the minutes leading up to the start of tonight's presentation, we were having you answer various poll questions. To start out our presentation tonight, we'll be going over the answers for those poll questions. Here is our first one. What do you think, Lisa and Kelly? Oh, this is exciting. So more than half of the folks that are attending tonight don't have a field trip or day outing program. So it sounds like this is the webcast for you then. <laughs> Great, thank you. Great. Nice to hear. Okay. We're going to move on to the next poll question answer. And here are our results. What are you guys thinking? That's great that 51% um, do foster for all dogs, including longer stay. Fantastic. That is fantastic. Okay, and our final answer to the poll questions is this one. And looks like we have some great answers again. What do you guys think? I think we'll take care of D in this presentation, um, and then um, <laughs> the logistics we'll also be discussing. So I think that it'll that'll be a, be helpful. I think absolutely, and I think that uh, we're you know a third of the a third of the folks have answered that they're worried about it being stressful for the dog. So hopefully um, we'll be sh we'll be sharing with you uh, the results of our nationwide study that we've conducted over the past year, and hopefully that will assuage some of, of um, uh, folks attending their fears about letting the dogs um, leave the shelter and, and come back. Thank you. And with that, we're going to go to our first poll question. Fantastic. So um, as we get started tonight, this is Lisa. As we get started tonight, one of the things I would like for, um, for folks to consider is what makes life in the shelter difficult for dogs? Um, and we have a poll here with a variety of, of different sort of stimuli in the environment. And I just wanted you guys to um, note, which ones do you think make it hard for dogs living in the shelter? Okay, thank you, Lisa. So you're going to be wanting to answer this on your screen and not in the Q&A window. You have several answers. You can choose noises, the presence of other dogs, confinement, changes in their normal routine, the loss of those close to them, or other factors. I'll give you a couple more seconds to go ahead and answer that. Okay, and we'll move on to the answer slide. And it looks like we have our answers, Lisa and Kelly. Fantastic. Yes, it seems like everyone agrees that being in the shelter is quite difficult. Um, and, and I think that this is, this is, I think, really great that everyone is considering um, all the different challenges, that it may not necessarily be just one thing. So with that, I, I want to... Um, kind of segue into um, a video we have here. Um, as we get started here, um, I want you to kind of consider life um, for these dogs living um, in the shelter and, and see if it uh, lines up with some of the thoughts you were thinking about challenges in the shelter. Right, and so as we're watching this video, we see that um, 
we see that dogs are housed usually by themselves. Um, we see that um, it's I, I'm not sure if the, if the audio is on, but it's quite loud in the shelter. Uh, and we see that the space itself isn't very large. And this is what I want us to start thinking about. What are the challenges for, for dogs living in shelters? And so, as we saw in the video, we often have the dogs are housed by themselves. And that can happen for a number of reasons. It can happen because um, we're worried about dogs getting um, into fights um, when we're not around, or just simply to prevent disease. But as we see in this video, and we're thinking about our own experiences in the shelter, dogs do what dogs like to do, right, in the shelter. So whether um, that's, you know, running around, potentially playing with someone, maybe that's actually uh, just getting up um, on a couch and, and hanging out um, for several hours of the day, that's not necessarily something um, the dogs can do. And lastly, this is something that virtually everyone responded with, and that is the shelter itself is quite loud. And in fact, in several studies, we found that um, the decibel range of noise in a shelter can exceed 90 decibels, which is um, the limit that's recommended for us when we're not even, um, when we're for humans. Um, having, um, unex having exposed ears. So, and in fact, in one of these studies, they found that six months of, of, um, of exposure actually resulted in hearing loss for dogs. So I think all of the concerns that we mentioned in that, in that previous poll, I think definitely play out um, in the literature. So the other thing I want to mention is um, this sort of lack of control and predictability in the environment. And when we think of lack of control, we think of a uh, dog's um, way in which they can interact with people. Think about all the times that um, a dog may be up at the front of the kennel and folks are walking past and the dog is quite social. And so when he, he or she sees somebody approach, he approaches in anticipating um, an interaction, but folks keep on, keep on walking by. And so this sort of way in which they've known the world to be is, is, is a bit different. And then we have that predictability piece. And we know plenty of dogs that really like their routine. They like, to, you know, and they, that may be a couple meals a day. That may be walks at a certain time. And, a lot, and so when we think of this lack of control and lack of predictability, it can have significant psychological impacts on dogs. So let's take this whole sort of shelter environment as a whole. We have a novel environment that the dogs likely haven't been in before. It's got its sights and sounds that, that are new to the dogs. We have spatial restrictions. We have limited social contact with dogs and people. And for dogs that maybe were just owned um, or coming from a home, they're now separated from people they were close to. So all of this can contribute to de decreased welfare. And so I don't think I have to tell this audience at all why this matters, but there's plenty of dogs that are living in shelters. And I think as we um, try to uh, save more lives in shelters, I think one of the things we need to start considering is welfare, because as they wait longer, now animal shelters aren't these sort of temporary ports in the storm, but they're more like orphanages. So thinking about what we can do to improve the environment while we're there is a, is a big deal. So how do we go about doing that? So petting, just simply petting, has um, been shown to reduce cortisol, and cortisol is a, a stress hormone um, that we can measure in dogs. People have it too, so do rats. And so, um, and so what we've seen is just um, petting a dog after they've had a blood draw can reduce anxiety-like behavior um, and show reductions in cortisol. And in fact, less than half an hour of walking um, in human interaction can reduce cortisol and improve the behavior of dogs in shelters. And the cool thing about uh, petting and hanging out with dogs is that we can be doing just that. We can hang out, we can pet, we can play with them, and we can get reductions in cortisol um, as compared to if they're just left in the kennel or being removed but without a person. And so this idea of us, um, being important to the to improving the welfare of dogs um, is something um, that's been that's already been shown. All right, so why we're here, right? So fostering, if we we think about it, is the ultimate human animal interaction intervention for dogs in the shelter. And while I think intuitively we 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 believe that fostering will help dogs, um, that being out of the shelter is better than um, than than a prolonged time in in, in the um, in the shelter environment. We don't really know a lot about it um, scientifically. So, but when we think about it, right, that um, that hanging out with a dog is 
is petting uh, times times very many, right? That uh, that um, if we increase the exposure to people, we get them out of that environment into a home, we can likely reduce the stress for, for the dogs living in the shelter. And so what do we know about, um, is there anything in the literature about um, uh, fostering or getting out of the shelter. And in fact, there is. There are a few studies that have looked at things like temporary or trial adoptions. And in fact, and I'm sure many of you are aware, there's the Adoption Ambassadors Program from the ASPCA. And one of the things that I that um, I love about um, about these studies is that they show that um, that these dogs that enter these temporary trial adoptions or are part of um, of the Adoption Ambassadors Program, they return less frequently than dogs that are adopted from the shelter. And another great thing is that programs like Adoption Ambassadors, um, the folks that adopt the dogs in these programs actually report using the information from the fosterer more than the folks at the shelter perhaps because, you know, they've lived with a dog and they view that information as being more useful to them. So that's what we know so far. And so it was with that sort of limited sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of um, uh, results of, of fostering in the, in the shelter environment that we set out to try to understand more about temporary fostering and, and if it could impact the lives of dogs in shelters. And so um, our first study was a pilot study at Best Friends Animal Sanctuary in Kanab, Utah. And the reason why we ended up there was because um, we wanted to conduct research. Best Friends is a wonderful uh, research partner with us. And um, they had questions themselves about um, their sleepover program. And just briefly, their sleepover program, uh, folks come in and volunteer. And then um, they, they spend just one shift at, at, at the sanctuary. And they're um, then available to, or are able to uh, take dogs out for an overnight and then bring them back in the morning. And the thing was is that um, as many of you responded, that, they were, that there was kind of questions um, at the sanctuary. Is this something that's helpful for dogs? It was certainly something that um, we get more information, but um, was it adversely affecting them? And so that's where the science comes in, that we can answer these questions. And so we were investigating at Best Friends whether a one-night sleepover would affect their welfare um, as measured by their cortisol response. And could it be predictive of future in-home behavior? And so how did we go about doing this? Well, as I mentioned, cortisol is a stress hormone, and, um, and it, 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 uh, it's systemically circulated throughout the body. Um, and uh, one way we can measure it is in urine. So you can see our, our friendly pup here in the photo uh, demonstrating exactly how we go about uh, collecting it. And so cortisol has these diurnal fluctuations. So when we collect the urine is really important. And so during the study at Best Friends, we collected it at three different time points. The morning before they went on the sleepover, immediately when they got back, um, usually it was that morning before the person brought them back to, to the shelter, and then the next day. So we're essentially seeing what is, the, what is the stress level of the dog before they leave the shelter, during their sleepover, and then after. So now we have our, our first uh, poll question inside our, our, um, our presentation here. So what do we think? Do we think that leaving the shelter and coming back uh, to the shelter is stressful for the dogs? Thank you, Lisa. Remember, everybody, to go ahead and answer this question on your screen and not in the Q&A window, um, yes or no. We'll give you a few more moments to go ahead and answer that. And in that time, I'm just going to remind you about the great resources down in the uh, resource widget at the bottom of your screen. Go ahead and go check those out when you get a chance. Okay, moving on. And here's our answers, Lisa. Fantastic. Right. And so I think we're kind of split here. And I think that that represents a lot of the sort of um, feelings we had when we went into the study. We weren't sure. Um, and we wanted, again, we wanted to use science to try to help answer these questions for us. And so here's what we found. That in fact, when the dogs were at the shelter, you'll see um, here on this graph that um, we have before, um, during the sleepover and after, that's on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, we just have the cortisol to creatinine ratio. So that's their cortisol and that's their level of cortisol. And so what we see is that just one night out in a foster, um, either on site at Best Friends because they have cabins or off site in town, significantly reduced dogs' cortisol levels. 
And so that was very exciting to us. We, we didn't imagine than just one night out. And this is probably leaving at 3 or 4 p.m. and coming back at 8 or 9 um, a.m. the next day would make a difference. But that was pretty exciting. But as you'll see, their cortisol levels return to um, the same as when, as when they left. Um, and so that was something of interest to us. Um, and we wanted to know. Um, you know, they return, but we wanted to get at the question that all of you are asking is that, well, maybe after they return, does it continue to go back up? Um, certainly some previous research of dogs that when they first enter the kennel suggests that, that cortisol does increase um, when you first come into the kennel. So this was a question definitely for us that we wanted to answer. So we were lucky enough that um, Maddie's um, awarded us a grant to answer this question. So we embarked on a four shelter study across the U.S. And so this is the research we were carrying out this summer. And, uh, oh, sorry, there's a question. <laughs> okay, Lisa, you're on a roll. Uh, we do have a question from the audience. I'm going to go ahead and push it to everybody's yes. slide view area. Okay, so our first question is, what about risk for priming a separation anxiety issue? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think that that is um, some of the things that we're trying to understand with, um, with collecting additional measures after, after uh, the dogs have uh, returned. So um, I'm going to, can I click to the next slide? Is that okay? Or back to the slide? Perfect. So this is why we're collecting more urine. We want to know about that. We want to know if we're seeing an, an increase in cortisol because I think that that, is, that would be one way we could get some evidence that maybe actually this is stressful. Um, but we also, um, we don't have a lot of understanding if, in fact, separation anxiety actually is more prevalent in shelter dogs than um, in home populations. That's something we're not quite sure about, and we definitely need more data on that. So, um, so again, I think this sort of, um, the data I'll be presenting to you in just a few seconds will help answer some of that, um, but I think, I, think, I think it's a great question. Um, so uh, to get at um, understanding more about the dog's experience, uh, experience at the shelter before the sleepover, we collected two days um, of urine uh, before they left. So that's the day before, the morning before, and then the morning right before the sleepover. And then these were now two-day sleepovers. So our fosterers collected urine the, the first morning and the second morning right before they came back. And then we collected two days after the dogs returned to the shelter. All right. And so, um, like I mentioned, we uh, worked with best friends in, in, in the first study. And then we worked with Arizona uh, Humane Society in Phoenix. We worked with Humane Society of Western Montana in Missoula. We worked with Lifeline Animal Project at their uh, decay, uh, Decatur Animal Shelter, uh, Decab Animal Services. And then lastly, we worked with the SPCA of Texas in Dallas. And I just want to thank all of those shelters for working with us because we absolutely couldn't do the work without them. So what you'll see here is that this is our result from Arizona Humane Society. And I think the first thing that you'll be struck by is that it's very similar to what we saw at Best Friends. Um, even though we're collecting more urine, more, you know, just more urine overall, but uh, two days before, two days during, and two days after, we're seeing, and you'll see that those lines with the stars indicate significant results. So we know that they're significantly different. Not that just there's a difference, but there's an actual significant difference from what we're seeing before and after. And so what we see is that there's differences that first day compared to the fourth, the third and fourth day, the same, for that second day, again, in the shelter, compared to when they're on the sleepover that first and second day. And we do see some increase um, when they return. But you'll notice the means, that's what's in those square um, white boxes on each of the bars. You'll see that it's actually lower, not significantly slow, but definitely not higher. So those are the results of Arizona Humane Society, which we were quite pleased with. And again, we see um, a very similar trend at Humane Society of Western Montana. And I have to, and I want to note that these shelters are actually quite different. Arizona Humane Society um, is, is, is quite large. They do, I think, about uh, lat, when we were carrying out this study, they t had an intake of about 6,000 dogs, whereas we have Humane Society of Western Montana, and they take in um, under 1,000 dogs each year. And so what we see is that um, the dogs um, have significant reductions when they go on 
the sleepover, again, first day, second day before to after, um, sorry, in the sleepover, and then after. And again, does it rise back? Yes, it does rise back when they come back to the shelter, but it's not higher than when they left or before they left. And again, we're seeing a similar trend at DeKalb Animal Services. The dogs um, have significant reduction when they're on the sleepover and their cortisol response, and then they come back to the shelter, um, and it's a bit higher than it was at the sleepover for sure, but definitely not any higher than before they left. And then we have our last shelter, SPCA of Texas, and what we see is a, a, a less of a of, of a, um, effect of the sleepover, but we still see the same the same trends. We actually have a bit more variability in in, in their data, um, the dogs and uh, their cortisol response, but we're seeing the same thing that before the dogs leave, it's higher. They go on the sleepover, it's lower. They come back, and they're right about where they started from. So hopefully, at this point, I've um, hopefully provided a bit of evidence uh, to, to uh, help you come to the conclusion um, that we have, that in the five shelters that we've worked with, we've demonstrated that temporary sleepovers of just one or two nights result in uh, significant cortisol reductions without significant increases upon rec return compared to baseline levels. So that's, oh, we have a question. Yes? Okay, we do have a question for you, Lisa, and we'll be pushing it to the slide yeah. area. Okay, Lisa, what about the diurnal fluctuations? Hopefully I said that right. <laughs> Maybe it's you usually did. lower at did. night regardless of environment. No, I think that's a really wonderful question, and yes. I would, I would agree with you. The diurnal fluctuations when we're measuring cortisol is a big deal. So we want to make sure we're doing it at the same time. And it is likely higher upon wakening than lower um, in the evening. But remember, we're catching the dogs at all exactly the same, you know, relatively the same time window of a couple hours every day for every dog in this study. Okay. So... We see our, our, you know, the, the data from, our cortisol data from the sleepovers, but are there other benefits to sleepovers? And this, this sort of information I'll be sharing with you are, it, it was what we observed um, working um, with these five shelters. We didn't just ask them to collect urine. We traveled across the country working at each site for, um, for a month, um, learning about uh, their foster program, their sleepover program, um, and, um, and just all the ins and outs. And so what, were some of the um, observations we had of working with these, like I said, very different shelters. So with that, I want to ask you before I, before I spill the beans and tell you some of the things that we saw, what do you guys think are some other benefits besides stress reduction of a sleepover program? Okay, so everybody go ahead and answer that on your screen and not in the Q&A window. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that it is a check all that apply. So you have multiple choices. Uh, you can choose increased community engagement and support, increased opportunities for meeting potential adopters, better adoption matches due to more information, the dog gains one or more advocates, increase in number of fosters, or other benefits. I'll give you a couple more seconds to answer. Okay, and we're going to go ahead and move to the answer side. All right, it looks like we Fantastic. have some answers for you, Lisa. Oh, this is great. Okay, yes, absolutely. The the um, questions that you guys have keyed in on are definitely, and I'm, I I wish we had more back and forth that we could hear about the other benefits. Um, but absolutely, and these are the things that we saw when we. Um, were um, observing the dogs um, after their sleepovers. In fact, so on the on the behavior side of things, as a behaviorist, that's something I'm very interested in. We observed that the dogs in the kennels were just a little bit more relaxed, a little bit less frantic, and they were actually more engaged with people, which that makes sense, right? Um, that uh, having the opportunity to engage with people, um, not just maybe right an hour out of the kennel, but they're living with someone, that that really helps kind of freshen up their skills about how they hang out with people. And so I think it's certainly possible that there could be longer term uh, behavioral benefits than just cortisol reductions, and maybe actually they're related to each other right, that reducing that cortisol actually has like a sort of feedback effect with what we're seeing with the behavior. And so I think one of, these, one of the things we need to consider with 
brief sleepovers is could it actually preserve the behavioral health of the dog? That it's not just for dogs that, you know, are struggling with the kennel environment, but it's actually useful for dogs that are perfectly sound for whatever reason. Um, maybe they're not getting, not getting adopted, or maybe they just have a, a volunteer that really likes them and wants to take them home for the weekend. I think uh, keeping up their behavioral skills with people, with other dogs is a great idea. All right. And as, as I think many of you agreed, we believe that the sleepovers definitely help increase the dog's social networks. The foster parents regularly were posting on Facebook, they were sharing photos, and they were taking the dogs out and about on the town, um, going to social events. So this exposure the dogs were getting beyond just being in the kennel um, was, was, was huge. And, um, and now when the dogs came back, there were photos that could be put on their website, and they learned so much more about the dogs that that could be put in adoption, either in a profile or shared with the adoption counselors, that when they're counseling folks, they have more information to go on because they know what the dog has been like in a home. One of the wonderful things we saw was the advocacy for the dogs after the sleepover. Foster parents would continue to check in on the status of the dog, and oftentimes these volunteers were volunteers that would come and walk dogs or were part of some other in-shelter program, and so they were checking in on the dogs. They were networking dogs. We had um, one... Uh, uh, one gal at SPC of Texas, and she uh, networked the, the dog that she slept over with an aunt, and the aunt actually ended up adopting the dog. And I think the wonderful thing was is that um, some even continued to foster the dog after the sleepover. They brought the dog back because it was part of the study, right, and so we had to measure uh, the urine for the next couple days, but they continued to foster the dog because it was a good fit. And I can't, you know, mention this, I, I can't, you know, say this slide without mentioning that we had dogs that were adopted. And these were dogs that folks thought they were, they were, I, I'm thinking of two dogs in particular, SPCA of Texas, and these dogs were long-stay dogs, and, uh, and staff were worried about them, and they sent them out on a sleepover. Um, in one case, they were actually kind of worried because the dog had some pretty bad kennel presentation, and they weren't sure what to expect, and in fact, she acted completely different, very calm and relaxed, and the family liked her so much um, that they decided to permanently, you know, permanently keep her in the home, which was wonderful. And so lastly, I want to mention about sleepovers, um, the benefits of the sleepover per program, that I think it can really help your foster recruitment. Um, one of the most wonderful things I heard in our study was when we were at Arizona Humane Society and one of our volunteers said, I can do anything for a day and a half. And I think that really, that really stuck with us, that, you know, it's not this um, commitment that um, may last long, may, you know, last too long, that it's only a couple days. And so I think that open-ended fostering sometimes can be daunting, but short-term fostering, I think that's really something that folks can do. It allows this very low barrier to entry to kind of hook fosters in, and they get to try it out. We had folks in the study that, again, these are just volunteers that wanted to be fosters but didn't think they could fit it into their schedules. They try this out and realize, hey, that's not too hard, and it's something that they can actually fit into their schedules. And I think the wonderful thing is is that now you've got this new group of volunteers, and um, you, can work you can work around their schedule and include them in um, this type of program that, again, maybe was foster like longer-term fostering they hadn't thought of. And lastly, I love that um, these sort of, these sleepovers really help us learn more about the fosters. We get to learn more about their likes and dislikes, um, what type of dogs they like, what type of dogs maybe don't fit into their, their lifestyle. And, um, and I think that, that that really helps keep all of us happy with, um, with um, you know, the way in which um, we work together with volunteers. So with that, that's the uh, end of, of my portion, um, but I want to hand it off now to Kelly. Hi. We're going to talk about some logistics of sleepover programs at several different shelters. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit, um, uh, kind of touching on what Lisa was just saying, uh, a little story about how I kind of got into this and a, a dog named Corey. Um, the, the dog in this slide is Daisy. Um, you'll see Corey on the next slide. So I started volunteering at the Fairfax County Animal Shelter about five years ago. And right after I started, they started a weekend foster program. And one thing they did that was, that was awesome was they made all volunteers automatically fosters, which kind of took that barrier of all, you know, the foster uh, training and onboarding process and just kind of took that and moved it to the side. We didn't have to do that, which was wonderful for me because I had been wanting to be a foster, but I'd never gotten around to starting the process. 
Um, but since we were volunteers, you know, we were all able to handle the, the shelter dogs and we knew the dogs. And, you know, it was, a, it was just a great, um, a really stroke of genius. Um, short-term foster was a game changer, not only for the shelter, but also for my family. We were sure that we were too busy to be long-term fosters, but weekends sounded totally doable to us. So Corey was one of our first fosters, and he was one of the shelter's longest day dogs. He started out fine. Um, he'd been there for a month. Um, he started out fine, and he's great for months, but then his time and on the shelter stress really made him difficult to manage. He got jumpy and mousy and really tough to walk, and then he started, like, making up games for himself in the kennel. So I'd walk into the kennels to do my volunteer shift, and there he'd be, like, standing in his kennel, smiling with this giant Kong in his mouth. And he'd look me in the eye, and he would dunk his Kong, he would drop it into his water bucket. And then as I'm standing there, he would take his giant head and splash it into the water bucket and put his entire head in there. And like a, just a beat later, he would come up and like literally breach like a whale. The water would spray everywhere. And he would be like victorious with this Kong in his mouth. He had found it in the bottom of his water bucket. You know, everyone rejoiced. I thought it was the cutest, most adorable thing ever. It was definitely messy. Adopters did not think the same thing. <laughs> so he was one of the dogs that was on the adoption floor, and adopters were kind of like quickly walking by his kennel. And then, you know, there was, you know, certain people who kind of started whispering, maybe it was time. Maybe, maybe Corey, you know, had had his run and that was it. So it gets me choked up. <clears throat> Anyway, so with Corey's life hanging in the balance, we brought him home. And lo and behold, Corey was a totally normal dog. He was awesome. My, um, my whole family loved him. We took tons of pictures, and the shelter posted them on their main page. Days later, he'd been there for literally months with, like, not even a bite. Days later, a family saw the photos that he had, um, that we had taken in foster, and they forwarded them to a friend who had had a dog who looked just like him who had passed away several months before. And that family came in and adopted him. So over the next few months, we took home several more fosters, and the same thing happened with them. We'd take a long stay dog on foster for the weekend. We'd take photos. The shelter would post them, and they were adopted within days, literally every time. I started to wonder if we had some kind of, like, crazy, amazing luck. Like there was something magic going on. Like it, it was, I, I just couldn't, I just couldn't fathom how this would keep happening. But then after like several other people started weekend fostering and, and it just kept happening to all of us, I started realizing that it wasn't magic. This is actually what short-term foster does. It gives the potential doctors insights into the dog's behavior and it helps them make that emotional connection with dogs. And in the case of severely stressed out dogs like Corey, it can save their lives. Here's a big surprise. After a few weekends we, we had under our belt doing foster, we realized that long-term foster would actually fit into our schedules pretty well. And um, several, quite a few of the other weekend fosters um, realized the same thing. By far the most common question I'm asked is how can I find more fosters for big dogs? Probably the most effective, effective solution is short-term foster. It is so much easier for potential fosters to commit to an overnight than in multiple weeks or months of foster care. So short term really helps people open up that pool of potential fosters and helps fosters feel more comfortable taking home pets, especially big dogs. And in Fairfax's case, short term foster really helped change the shelter's culture toward fostering big dogs. So with that said, let's get into some program statistics. There are some things you might want to consider that will help you tailor your sleepover foster program to your organization and its needs. Um, so the questions you might want to think about asking are, um, who will be allowed to foster? Um, will it be fosters? You know, will it be foster staff and volunteers? Or will you consider allowing the public to participate? Where, uh, who is available to go to foster? Will you allow any dog to go to foster? Or will you be focusing on certain groups, like, say, the groups that need it the most, long shelter stays, senior dogs, that kind of a thing. How can you run the program most efficiently? And this is probably one that everyone will be asking themselves. Um, and that is, um, 
you know, how can you do it with the least amount of, of work and how can you do it the most effectively? Who can you recruit to help? And, and then would a foster assistant or two be helpful? Uh, most, most weekend and overnight foster programs that I know of do have, uh, at least one foster assistant and they, they can help, um, do help with the logistics, like, you know, putting together packages of supplies and helping fosters, you know, meet with dogs, helping them put, put harnesses on, that kind of thing. So this is Corey. You just see the back of his head. We took a little, uh, trip to the Shenandoah, one of the days that we had him. Um, so we're going to look at the, the logistics of programs at three different shelters tonight. The first two, Austin Animal Center and the Fairfax County Animal Shelter, are in communities that have really similar population sizes. Both have about a million residents. But Fairfax's shelter has a relatively low intake, about 4,500 pets a year, while Austin's is about four times that, with about 18,000. Their programs are tailored to their really different needs. Fairfax has a short length of stay and generally has about a dozen dogs on the adoption floor at any given time, sometimes less. They have an amazing volunteer program. The dogs get out of the shelter, get out of their kennels more than any shelter I know of, um, usually between about three and five times a day. Austin Animal Center has several hundred dogs on the adoption floor at any given time, and they're open every day of the week. Dogs get out of their, cat, out of their kennels an average of about, of about one to three times per day. So in Austin Animal Center, their program is open to current volunteers and fosters, which when you, Tell people that on your main social media page makes people want to take your foster orientation and join your foster program. Um, with the high number of dogs on the adoption floor at any given time and the shelter open every day of the week, allowing overnights every evening makes a lot of sense. Fosters can pick up their dogs prior to 7 p.m. on the night of the sleepover, and then they're asked to bring them back by 11 a.m. the next day, and then they then so then they're there for the time when the shelter opens, so all the dogs are on the floor. Uh, participants can grab their own supplies and check out a dog anytime at any of the shelter's customer service desk. The great thing about this program is that it adds virtually no work to the foster coordinator's plate, except for making sure the photos, text, and video from the outings get up on social media, and then like some kind, some troubleshooting, because it does involve customer service staff, and it works just kind of like an adoption. Um, the program actually encompasses both overnight and field trip for foster. So if you'd like to learn a little more about it, there's a video in the webcast on foster field trips, and it's, it's actually the same program. Um, I just focused on both, you know, the two sides of it here. The Fairfax County Animal Shelters program is open to current volunteers, staff, and fosters. The shelter's closed on Sundays and Mondays, and that makes it like the perfect time to do weekend foster, because this way the dogs are in the weekend foster at times when the potential adopters aren't in the building anyway, and then they come back refreshed when the, the shelter reopens at noon on Tuesday. Dogs are generally chosen from among the um, dogs available for adoption. Candidates for weekend foster are chosen and an email is set out that lists them for us, um, that, that lists which dogs are available. And that'll come sometime a couple of days before the um, scheduled pickup at, of 4 p.m. on Saturdays. So if any of the dogs are adopted before that scheduled time, then they're just re removed from the list. And um, that foster can be rematched with a different dog if they'd already chosen. So when foster caregivers arrive at the shelter, foster assistants help them gather needed supplies and they help with harnessing and leashing of the dogs. Caregivers sign the, uh, the regular uh. foster agreement for the shelter. Any medication the dog is taken is given to the foster, and then the foster schedule the time they'd like to bring the dog back to the shelter. New fosters are advised to keep their own pets separate from their foster dog for the weekend. And then if they decide to introduce their pets to the foster, they're asked to let the staff know and um, talk to them and make sure they have a, place, a plan in place to, to introduce the dog. So what we are going to do now, um, we're going to talk about Humane Rescue Alliance's In Real Life program. It is a, um, it's a overnight foster program. It was created in early seven, two, 2017 for two reasons, to gather more information on the behavior of the dogs outside the shelter, and also to help build the confidence of the fosters in order to, to help increase the number of foster caregivers for big dogs. 
The, dog, the program tar targets the dogs who need it the most. Among them are those who are showing signs of kennel stress, long stay dogs, fearful dogs, and seniors. What I really love about this program is it is really well organized and it is focused on collecting data, not just on the dogs, but on the program successes. So they've really fine tuned their data collection method so it's easy to find you know, uh, the relevant program statistics, such as like how many caregivers are electing to keep their foster until adoption? How many dogs went to foster last, last month? How many staff are participating? So we are gonna move to the video um, and it will, it'll tell you a little bit more about this program. Okay, so typically for people to foster animals through us, they have to have been through a foster orientation. And what we did is we opened up the criteria for our foster parents. So anybody who has been through foster orientation, anybody who is an employee of our organization, and then any volunteer who has gone through dog handling training is able to take a dog for IRL. So what we did is we set up a Google form where um, interested foster parents could indicate that they were ready to take an IRL dog home. The way we fit this in, because it is another thing in addition to a normal path for fostering, is we're super organized about it. For our brand new IRL foster parents, they're sent home with a program guide, emergency contact information, and then they're asked to just sign a quick release when they pick up their foster the first time. Repeat IRL fosters literally just need to come with their leash, sign the foster contract, and they're on their way. We set our foster parents up with the expectation that they are providing all of the care needs for their animals. So they'll have food, they'll have a crate, they'll have um, toys and a bed if, if that's what they want to provide for their um, foster dog. We will provide a fitted harness and a leash so it's easy for pickup. Um, and if they require any additional supplies, we ask that they either request those in advance before they even come pick up or that they just have them ready and on hand so that pickup is a smooth and easy and quick process. We ask that when they have their dogs in their home, that they're, if they're on social media, that they do at least one social media post about that animal in a home. And then we have another Google form that we call our IRL homework that we ask them to fill out within 24 hours of returning the dog back to um, our facilities. And it basically asks what it was like to live with that dog. We put that um, information in the animal's records. Adoptions can use it, we can build it into their profiles, but it's really great information, especially for potential adopters or for us then to promote to full-time fosters who wanna take that dog. So essentially, the beauty of using Google Forms is that it magically dumps into a spreadsheet for you. So it kind of organizes the information for you. Um, and then I have a great program coordinator who really is good at formulas, and she set up a couple little formulas to help us organize the flow of the data coming in. So that makes it really easy for us to organize who's ready for animals, and then once we match them with an animal, keeping track of that animal through return, making sure that we're getting that homework in and all of that good stuff. So the other thing that's really great about this program is you, if you initially take the dog for a short stay, but you fall in love with the dog, you can keep it for a traditional foster. You don't have to bring the dog back. You just let us know and we roll it over into a traditional foster stay. We also have some people who fall in love with the dog and want to adopt it, which is great. And all you have to do is complete the adoption process. As we heard there, providing supplies to fosters um, is not required. It is, um, there's this list, uh, is just some stuff to think about. The most important thing that you can do is just to make it clear to your foster caregivers, caregivers at the outset what supplies your organization will and will not be providing, um, so, so they know. So if you are interested in providing supplies, you might consider making an Amazon wish list or asking supporters for donations. Um, like Things like Adopt Me Best can sometimes be made by volunteers, which is great, um, and other things can be uh, ordered and, um, and donated. So Martin Eagle collars are really great because they, uh, I, I really like them because they tighten automatically with a pressure, with pressure in a way that kind of distributes the pressure around the neck, which is, is safer for a dog's airway, uh, and, but also makes an accidental collar pop off much less likely. Um, sturdy leashes are another really great safety tool. 
I, um, I do like harnesses and I, I like having one or two types because if you've ever been in that position of, of having like 80 different types of harnesses in one box and trying to figure out how to work, you know, work one that you pull out, it can take forever. Um, and, and could end up unsafe if they don't know how to put that harness on and they put it on wrong. Um, foster tags are a really good backup to have so that in case the dog gets away from its handler, um, the dog has identification on it. Um, Canelo here is mar mar modeling his easy walk harness and carabiner here. The carabiner, um, you can co connect one from the harness to the collar so that in case one of the, the two should happen to pop off, there's a backup. Um, I, I really like doing this for dogs who are reactive or just have high energy, um, just as like kind of like a backup tool. They're really inexpensive um, and I, I really like, I like, I like to use them. Uh, Ziploc bags can be helpful to have some of the food the dog's been eating at the shelter so that when they go home only for, you know, if they go home for a weekend, they don't have to adjust to a new food. It's just the same one. Um, definitely not required, but it, it can be helpful. Um, laminated kennel signs are a really easy way to make sure that the shelter staff and volunteers know where the dog is just by glancing at the kennel. Adopt me vests, leashes, and bandanas. They really help to draw attention to the dog while they're out on, on outings and to help spark more community engagement. Um, and just a couple other things to think about. With any foster care program, um, you know, organizations need to be transparent about the dog's history. Um, a lot of organizations have really clear adoption counseling processes in order to provide transparency about a dog's background or history to adopters. Um, and we just need to make sure that this process is just as clear when it comes to fosters. Um, the other thing is sleepover foster and social media work hand in hand. When your fosters take a dog on an overnight, if it's at all possible, make sure something gets up on social media about it. Their pictures, their video, their stories, or something. Um, it really can be reinforcing for them, and it also keeps the program's momentum going in your organization and your community. If you think of anything after this webcast, um, we, um, if you haven't joined Maddie's Pet Forum already, we highly recommend it. Um, we have an adult dog fostering group there where you can ask questions, support one another, and celebrate your wins, so do not hesitate to join it. Um, and then for more information on sleepover foster programs, including the operating procedures and some detailed information on the programs we talked about tonight, click on the resources icon. In the short-term foster manual, there is um, some more information on those. And I hope that we um, have been helpful and encourage you to move forward with your with adding sleepover fostering to your menu of foster services. Okay, thank you so much, Kelly and Lisa, for an amazing presentation. We do have some questions, so we'll be taking those now. I'm going to be pushing the first question to the, to the screen right now. Okay, so our first question is, how does a shelter deal with the onslaught of calls, emails, paperwork, and time with foster families when they can barely keep up with daily tasks? Adding an employee is not an option. Um, this is a really good question. Um, I think I think there's a few uh, angles that will really help with this. One is to get a you know a foster volunteer, somebody who can help with this program. The other thing is to really um, you you can consider having your current volunteers and fosters be um, be using the program, but also simplifying the onboarding process. One of the and I keep I talk about this all the time because I think it's the most amazing onboarding process I've ever heard. But um, Best Friends LA has a onboarding process that's it's completely um, barrier free. It's in Google Forms. The application is filled out in Google Forms. There is a video that's in there in the form. They watch a like I think it's only like 20 or 30 minutes uh, an orientation video, and then they check a little box that says, um, you know, did you that that they did watch this video, and then they answer about five to seven questions about the video and then they sign the agreement and it's all in the Google form. It can be accessed day or night, anytime, and it doesn't require any additional, you know, input from the, the staff of the, um, of, of the shelter, which uh, is, is great. So I think that there are just, there are several uh, different ways that that can be done. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Uh, we have our next question. 
Okay, so our next question is, I volunteer for SBCA and we have a doggy day date program, which is similar to the short-term foster. During the foster time, a dog bonds with a specific person. Isn't it stressful for that dog to come back to the shelter? I can take that question, this is Lisa. Um, I, and I think that that absolutely is a question that that um, we've wondered as we've gone to different shelters and, you know, seen the way that, that the dogs, you know, really enjoy spending time with people and getting out and about. Um, but I, I, what I would say is that I don't necessarily think uh, that the, the data suggests that. That that is certainly a worry for of all of us, that we don't want to be stressing out these dogs more than they already are. But I think what we see across different shelter types, different sizes, different, you know, all different ways is that um, these sleepovers reduce the stress of dogs. And when they come back, they're no higher than when they left. And so what I, you know, what uh, somebody uh, shared with me um, that I'd like to share with you is that these are essentially like weekends to our work week. We, sh we certainly wouldn't think that we should work seven days a week and never get a weekend. And I think that's what these function for these dogs. They certainly don't make all the stress go away, but they let the dogs rest and recharge. And I think that resting part is a big deal and come back and be able um, to face the shelter. So, and I think that people are an important part of reducing stress for dogs. Um, Lisa, I'm gonna just pop in here to say two things. One is that, um, I don't know, this is kind of a personal opinion, but I, the, even the best shelters, there are a few experiences that a dog can have that, that really, I think, compare to um, being in a shelter, even the best shelters, um, as a stressful experience. Um, shelters are innately stressful for a dog. Um, the other thing is building on the information that Lisa did here. Um, we've studied, we just got some preliminary results of a study from um, Louisville that did a dog, has a dog eating out program. And the data is coming back with, um, the preliminary data that the dogs are friendlier, they're happier, they're more confident, um, they're less anxious, less nervous, less, um, they do less panting and droop and barking and spinning, those kinds of behaviors on doggy day outings, which, um, you know, we, we, we don't have behavior data on them coming back to the shelter. However, I, I believe that um, what, the direction we're starting to be it going in is um, getting out of the shelter is really, really a, a, a good stress reliever. Okay, thank you very much for those great answers. I'm gonna be pushing our next question to the slide area in just a second. Okay, do you have any suggestions about introducing this info to <laughs> management staff that might be a bit resistant? Um, Lisa, I'll just jump in here really quick. I would say um, show them the data. Um, definitely show <laughs> them the data and <laughs> uh, the, the, the all everything that we know about these programs, and um, and and tell them some some of the you know great outcomes, some of the stories of these dogs. I think the other thing too is give it a try, pilot it. If you don't if you don't take our word mm -hmm. for it. Give it a try and see if it works. And I think, you know, you know, use volunteers that you know really well. Do all the things that you need to do to make yourself feel comfortable giving it a try and then see what happens. You don't have to take our word for it. Okay. Thank you. This uh, question kind of goes along the same point here with your data. Push it to the screen right now. Are you still looking for any additional points of data collection? <laughs> That's such a great question for a research scientist, always. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, we'll continue, we're going to be continuing to look at um, these type of, of, of foster programs um, along with field trips and longer term fostering. So I think if, if folks want to be a part of, of those type of studies, please stay tuned because we're, 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 we're going to want, um, want your help. Okay, thank you very much. Here's our next question.
Would you suggest setting a pickup drop-off time for weekend fosters or have it open-ended where they can take home and bring back at any time? I think it's whatever whatever is easier for your, you know, your shelter to manage or your organization. Um, I know in Fairfax it um, it seems to be, you know, easiest to, to have everybody do it at the same time because you have the foster assistance and everybody can be there for that time. Um, but but it really at, if in Austin since they do it through customer service, it doesn't really matter if everybody's there at the same time. So it really depends on your program and what you're more comfortable with and what works best for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Here's our next question. Were the requirements for the sleepover family? Um, so, I'm guessing. Oh, do you I didn't mean, know if they were talking uh, about like <laughs> requirements to get into the program or um, to do? So. <laughs> I'm going to say to get, get to get into the program. Um, in, in in all three of the the shelters we mentioned, they the sleepover families had to be current fosters or volunteers. Um, the requirements. Um, trying to think of any that I that I didn't mention. Um, you know, uh, the the, dog, the dogs could not go to dog parks, and they couldn't introduce them to any you know dogs other than the dogs in their home. Um, I think that's you know um, pretty basic for safety because you don't know it, you know your own dogs, but you don't know who you're going you know the the temperament of the dog that you might be introducing them to. So it's probably better to not <laughs> not not even go there. And I, on a two night. And I actually actually just wanted to follow up on that is that in um, while at Best Friends the dogs actually were going into sleepovers with no other dogs at all of our other four shelters. The dogs had situate, you know, they were being fostered by dog people that may have had dogs, um, and so that was a really different sort of scenario. And I think that, you know, we were wondering about that as well. Is that wow, we did this at Best Friends? They're, they don't have any dogs. What's it going to be like when um, when we add dogs? And and unlike what Kelly had said, we let them interact with the other dogs in the home. And so the way we helped make that successful, and we've tried it both ways, um, is that really helping. Um, the um, foster foster families um, have a, a bring their dogs in and introduce the dogs. Um, it just went so much better. Um, we learned more about the the fosters uh, dogs and what they liked and what they didn't like with the family, and then also like their connection with the dog. I think that's an important part of it, not just like how the dogs get along, but you know, if there's several dogs that typically they could sleep over, and so um, finding the a good match for them made everybody so much happier in the end, the dogs and the people. Okay. That's a good answer. Thank you very much. We have our next question, which is a popular question. It's one about liability. So what kind of liability waivers are you using? Different um different shelters are using different ones. Um, I know Fairfax uses their regular foster agreement, um, the regular liability they use for long-term foster. Um, the Humane Rescue Alliance um, liability waiver, it may be in the manual, or at least the, the foster agreement. Um, it might be in the short-term foster manual. If not, um, definitely join um, the Maddie's Forum. There is an adult dog foster group in there. Um, and, and ask that question, and I can, I can get you a copy of it. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, we have another question. Are the fosterers someone the dogs are familiar with or total strangers? Any difference? Um, the, the shelters that, that um, um, when I've done it, um, they are both. Um, some, some of them are familiar with the dogs and some are total strangers. And, um, and I have to say that as a weekend foster, I have taken home dogs who I have known through volunteering. And sometimes I've gone there and said, hey, who do you need me to take home? And they'll, hand, you know, they'll um, you know, tell me about a dog and I've never met that dog before, but I'll take it home. And really there hasn't been any difference at all as far as I can see. Lisa? Yep, we, 
we saw, yep, we saw the same thing that, in fact, because we would, we would go into a shelter and just intensively be get, collecting data for a month. Um, we had a foster sh- signing up who, you know, had not, you know, fostered before, like in the sleepover. And they were, we would, you know, have dogs that were okayed for the study and the folks would walk in and we'd walk with, walk in with them, uh, walk in uh, the room with a new dog. And, um, and then sometimes there were advocates at SPC of Texas. Um, there were some wonderful volunteers um, that, at, that that, um, that had connections to the dog. So I think we've, we've seen it done um, a lot of different ways, and so far we haven't seen a difference in the outcomes for the dogs. Okay, great. Thank you very much, both Kelly and Lisa. This will be our final question for the evening. I'm going to push it to the slide area right now. What are your thoughts on foster to adopt programs? Person comes in, wants to adopt, but would like to try it out first, maybe by taking the dog overnight. I think they can work in the in the right situations. I think, you know, if somebody wants to come in and take that, you know, tiny fluffy that is going to get adopted in 12 minutes, you know, it might not, you know, be worth it. But if you have a long stay dog and somebody wants to, you know, take it home overnight um, and, you know, uh, you have a you know a process in place to do that with. I think I think you know it could really be a good thing. Um, Lisa, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I I agree. I think that I think that when um, folks are interested in wanting you know in in trying out the dog, I mean I think the worst thing that happens is is that the the dog comes back and yes maybe they're mm-hmm. going to miss out on some time, but we also get more information about them and um, and I think that's an important part of the process too. And for our local sh- uh, one of our local shelters here in Phoenix, um, they had a really successful foster adopt that I think over I think. Over 70% of the foster to adopt converted to adoption. So I think it's definitely something uh, um, to give a try to. Great. Thank you very much. And with that, that will be the end of our presentation. Thank you, Lisa and Kelly and all of you for sharing your evening with us. Your opinion is important to us. So please take a moment to fill out the evaluation survey by clicking on the link on the screen. Join us for the next two foster series webcasts adult dog fostering on March 15th, and adult cat and kitten fostering on March 22nd. For more information, go to www.maddiesfund.org. Again, thanks for your participation in our webcast tonight. Have a great evening. Good night.